and he robbed us all of it. All that she hadn't checked on her daughter, so I knew instantly something was not right. Sexually exploited, extorted to be rehired whenever I was fired because I was discriminated on and put in dangerous positions time after time, day after day, week after week. Your skin color should not be the reason why there's lack of support in our community and law enforcement to help find you. You have to be found and we're praying that you're found alive. Each year, hundreds of exotic dancers are murdered and several others mysteriously vanish into thin air without a trace. It's still unknown why exotic dancers who work hard to entertain their patrons are subjected to such untold violence. Angela Rabat, Imani Armstrong, and Felicia Johnson were women who made a living from dancing and sadly lost their lives. On the 29th of March, 2014, 26-year-old Angela Rabat, who went by the stage name Climax, dropped off her three-year-old daughter with a babysitter as she was about to resume the day's work dancing. The job on this particular day was not at the strip club, but at a private party at a hotel in Midtown Atlanta. Angela didn't have her own car, so she called a friend to give her a ride. The party took all night, yet the organizers decided that the day was still young, so they moved the party to a home in the northern part of the city. Very early the following morning, the party finally ended. Angela decided to call her friend, Charles Outlaw, whom she had known since she was 15 or 16, to give her a ride back home. This was the last time anyone besides Outlaw laid eyes on Angela. She never made it home and didn't get in contact with any of her loved ones. It was more suspicious because she didn't pick up her daughter from the babysitter and would never do that unless something was wrong. Her family and friends proceeded to search a day after she went missing, but there were no signs of her anywhere. Outlaw also joined in the search. When police interrogated him, he said, he and Angela had gotten into an argument during the ride to her home. He complained about driving a long distance to pick her up. She, in turn, replied that she didn't need him and many men would volunteer to give her a ride in a heartbeat. He claimed she began texting several men in the car. During the journey, Outlaw stopped by his girlfriend's house, leaving Angela in the car. He claimed that she was gone by the time he returned to the car. He assumed she was still angry about their disagreement and had called someone else to give her a ride to stay away from him until she cooled off. The story didn't exactly have a hole in it, but detectives felt there was something suspicious about Outlaw's countenance. He willingly confessed to dealing drugs and having a warrant out for violating his probation. He was let go that day, while detectives followed other leads on Angela's whereabouts. On the second day of the search, he was arrested for the crimes he confessed to. This would give the police an opportunity to have him in their custody while they dug up everything they could on his possible connection to Angela's disappearance. Immediately, as the officer placed the handcuff on one of his hands, he attempted to run away. This was not the reaction of someone who had nothing to hide. He was restrained and handcuffed properly. To make matters worse for Outlaw, a friend of Angela said she had seen Outlaw in a car wash the morning Angela went missing. He was washing his car thoroughly, from vacuuming the interior to scrubbing the trunk. This raised suspicions because the vehicle was a rental. No one would perform such intensive cleaning on a car they rented for a short time unless they were trying to conceal or get rid of something. While police were trying to figure out where Angela was, some surveyors stumbled on a body near where outlaw claimed Angela had gone missing. Medical reports showed that it was Angela, 
and she had died from a gunshot to the back of the head. They needed to gather evidence from the car where they suspected the murder had occurred, but it had been thoroughly cleaned at the car wash. Fortunately, they found a gunshot residue inside the roof of the car. However, they needed more concrete evidence. They convinced Outlaw's girlfriend to wear a wire to visit him in jail. Outlaw was highly paranoid, so he suspected that their conversation was being recorded. He never thought she wore a wire, but felt the room was bugged. He didn't say much to her, and rather mouthed things and gestured. The girlfriend told police he told her that Angela had pulled out a gun to threaten him while they were arguing. Then they got into a scuffle, after which he successfully collected the gun from her. Outlaw told his girlfriend that he pointed the gun at the back of Angela's head and it went off. Police were convinced he had tweaked the story to make him look less guilty because autopsy results showed that it was a contact style wound. She was shot in the back of the head, execution style. That's not an accident, that's malice murder. Everything his girlfriend related to the police was consistent with the details of the murder. Outlaw's cell phone records also placed him near the scene of the murder at the same time it happened. Outlaw was charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, and concealing a body. He was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, with an additional 15 years in jail. Angie could always make you smile, no matter what. And he robbed us all of that. If you see me happy, just leave me alone. I deserve this. Imani Armstrong, a more recent case of violence exhibited towards exotic dancers is that of 25-year-old Imani Armstrong, who went by the stage name Red. Imani was a mother of three, working as a dancer and a waitress at IHOP. She had just completed her waitressing shift shortly before 5 a.m. on the 1st of September, 2022, when she began trekking to the train station, as she usually did. Imani was close to East 14th Street in New York, when a masked man approached her with a gun. The unknown man shot her in the back of the head and she slumped to the floor, dying instantly on the scene. A shop owner who had witnessed the shooting called 911 at 5 a.m. Imani was struggling at the time as her wife had recently filed for divorce from her. Two of her children were taken into custody of social services and a third child had been put up for adoption. She was at her breaking point, but didn't let these misfortunes break her. She was determined to get better for her children, so she took anger management classes. The first suspect in the case would have been Amani's ex-wife because she was also highly temperamental, but CCTV footage showed that the shooter was a man. The CCTV footage showed a man wearing a mask and sweatshirt waiting outside where Imani worked for five hours until she got off work. When she got off work, he secretly followed her from a distance through a few blocks before running up to her and shooting her in the back of the neck. The man was captured on another camera fleeing the area with a woman dressed in black. Soon police concluded that the individual in the footage bore a striking resemblance to one of Imani's baby daddies, Wilson Clarkson. Wilson was a 44-year-old man with whom Imani had previously dated and had a kid. Police secured a search warrant for Wilson's house. In his garbage, they found the clothes worn during the shooting. They also found two guns in his safe. Police records showed that he had been arrested over 20 times in the past for domestic violence. Back in 2018, he stabbed a woman in the chest for refusing to allow him to pimp her out. It was a brutal attack 
that required her to get about 150 stitches. There are speculations that Wilson murdered Imani because she refused to let him pimp her out too. On the 3rd of September, just two days after the murder, he was arrested and held without bail. He was charged with second-degree murder and two counts of criminal possession of a weapon. He is scheduled to appear in court again on the 10th of November, 2022. It's a case getting national attention, the disappearance of Felicia Johnson. While a large number of strippers get murdered, many also mysteriously vanish with no trace. In the case of a missing person, their loved ones hold out hope, despite knowing there is a high chance that it will be shattered. They are terrified because they have no idea what sort of hell the missing person might be going through if they were still alive and they are highly anxious for their return. This was what the family of Felicia Johnson had to face when the 24-year-old went missing on April 16, 2022. Felicia was a San Diego-based woman who had traveled to Houston to see relatives for her 24th birthday. During her visit, she attempted to secure a job at Cover Girls as a stripper, but was not given the job. She then posted an advertisement online for an escort service, and a customer booked her an Uber ride at 2.56 a.m. Felicia has not been seen or had contact with any of her family members since that time. After her family couldn't get through to her for an entire day, they tried tracking her cell phone. It was tracked to the roadside at Bear Creek Park, just four miles from the club. The family was devastated as the cell phone was covered in blood. However, they remained optimistic about her safe return. The entire park was searched for any clues on her whereabouts, but they came up with nothing. Texas EcuSearch, an NGO dedicated to finding missing persons, has gotten involved in the case. The team of volunteers deployed to search for Felicia found her purse in Bear Creek Park close to where her phone was recovered. Things really didn't look good for Felicia with the abandoned purse and blood-covered phone. Following the recovery of the purse, the Houston police have drawn up a timeline of Felicia's disappearance. She was last seen entering the Uber, ordered by a man named Chukwebuka Nwobodo. The Uber dropped her off at Nwobodo's old address at Windchase Boulevard before he picked her up with his own car and drove her to his current address in South Richmond. CCTV footage showed him leaving the apartment at 5.12 a.m. without Felicia in sight. There is no evidence that he returned to the apartment since then. Records showed that he purchased trash bags, a flashlight, a towel, and a mechanical saw between the 16th and 17th. His internet search history included information on whether bleach or vinegar could destroy DNA, the most forested part of Houston, how to delete one's search history, how to get away with murder, how to be a serial killer, and if police could check the phone records of a missing person, etc. On May 13th, police secured search warrants for his car and apartment. They found latex gloves, a gun, a knife, and a shovel in his car. Also, his apartment showed a strong presence of Felicia's DNA. He was arrested that same day with his phone confiscated, but was released for unknown reasons. The phone seized reportedly contained pictures of a dismembered female and three other pictures of dead people. Police have not been able to identify the people in the photos. Nobodo has since been charged with murder and tampering with evidence. However, he is still on the run and Felicia's body hasn't been found. If anyone has any information, please reach out to PD. Please do something to help us find Felicia.